The story of Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze, once close allies who became distant and even estranged, is more complex than is usually said. The most prevalent story about their rivalry is that Deleuze and Foucault were in competition for academic recognition, which fueled jealousy mainly on the part of Foucault. As François Deleuze says, some basic disagreements were surely motivated by a certain rivalry as to who incarnated the authority of critical thinking, at least so far as Foucault was concerned. This sentiment was echoed by a friend of Foucault, who says, I got the feeling that Foucault saw Deleuze as a rival. While it is likely that Foucault nurtured some resentment towards Deleuze, I think the disagreement was both much more and much less serious than is usually said. Much more serious, because it revealed differences in temper between two thinkers who represented Nietzschean thought the best in the modern world, and who found themselves, perhaps, in a situation of archetypal fratricide, but much less serious at the same time, because they ended up reconciling with each other, beyond the grave, as it were. And, it is true, mostly thanks to Deleuze. For example, when in 1986, just two years after Foucault's passing, a journalist asked Deleuze to address the rumors of their feud, Deleuze gave the following answer. I'll say this, the fact that Foucault existed with such a forceful and mysterious personality, the fact that he wrote such wonderful books with such style, has never caused me anything but delight. As Dust shows, the great mystery of their relation is that Deleuze did everything he could to avoid making Foucault the bad guy of the story, even at the price of giving up an opportunity to look like the good guy himself. We will see how Deleuze, who sometimes displayed almost saintly qualities, did everything he could philosophically and personally to make the story of his relation with Michel Foucault one that definitely could inspire us today, a story that is eternally and truly beyond good and evil. The initial encounter between Gilles Deleuze and Michel Foucault occurred in 1952 in Lille, in northern France. Deleuze, then a high school teacher, attended a conference by Foucault, who was an assistant in psychology at the local university. Following the conference, they met at a friend's place for dinner. However, the atmosphere during the first meeting was far from cordial. In fact, it was reportedly glacial. A full decade went by before their paths crossed again in 1962, prompted by Deleuze's publication of Nietzsche and Philosophy, a book that gathered admiration from many people, including Foucault. This newfound appreciation led Foucault to actively support Deleuze in his pursuit of a professorial position in university, but due to external political influences, Deleuze's appointment was delayed and he ended up teaching at the University of Lyon. But paradoxically, this setback brought Deleuze and Foucault closer together. They began to meet more frequently, with Foucault even extending the hospitality of his apartment to the Deleuzes on multiple occasions. This camaraderie led them to collaborate on a groundbreaking project, the publication of Nietzsche's complete works, imbued with a radical new interpretation. In so doing, they spearheaded a distinctive return to Nietzsche in France, challenging the prevailing influence of Hegel and psychoanalysis and its fixation on the ego. Their endeavor aimed not merely at a critique of the self, but at its dissolution, thus embodying a profoundly anti-Hegelian and anti freudian sentiment, which became their hallmark. Then, a first shadow was cast on their friendship. Pierre Klosowski, a prominent translator and commentator of Nietzsche, published his famous Nietzsche and the Vicious Circle in 1969, and he chose to dedicate it to Deleuze, not Foucault. While Klosowski did eventually dedicate another work to Foucault, called the Baphomet, the work was too transgressive even for that time, and did not attain the same level of success as did the Vicious Circle. But in spite of this, at the end of the 1960s, things were generally looking great for the two thinkers. Their careers were just beginning, and they were already famous authors. But then a major event occurred, which to this day has a quasi-mythical status in French society. If you speak with people who lived then, then trust me, you will hear all about it. And both Deleuze and Foucault played a major role in the event. The tumultuous and defining year of 1968. It is a period of quasi-civil war in the French Republic. Students and workers are fighting the police in every corner of the capital, and even beyond. It was also a period of great optimism. There was liberation and change in every corner of society. The educational system itself was in crisis, was forced to try something new, a new vision for education and innovation. And that materialized when the authorities approved the construction of a new university, the University of Vincennes. Foucault was entrusted with establishing the philosophy department at Vincennes, and so he naturally turned to Deleuze for collaboration. During this period, 
Deleuze was making waves with the publication of Difference and Repetition and the Logic of Sense. Hailed by Foucault as nothing less than philosophical revolutions, a new thought is possible, Foucault claimed, in sensing Deleuze's texts, a thought that he praised as dynamic, intensive, affirming, and non-categorical, joyously leaping and dancing before us and among us. Deleuze ended up teaching in Vincennes for many years. In fact, the earliest recorded seminar that we have, called State Apparatus and War Machine, was recorded during Deleuze's last year in Vincennes in 1979, one year before the university was definitely closed and torn down. In the early 70s, Foucault and Deleuze also allied around political action. Foucault and others created the Groupe d'Information sur les Prisons, called GIP. And yes, it's pronounced GIP, not GIP. An autonomous and decentralized group destined to inform prisoners about their rights. In a spirit of anti-repression, Foucault, Deleuze and other militants picketed in front of prisons, distributing flyers to family members who visited their relatives in prison, in order to inform them about their rights. The GIP was quite remarkable, for as Deleuze says in the seminars, I say that the GIP is the only leftist group that has functioned. Perhaps I'm exaggerating. It has spread in any case. Indeed, several other groups emulated its structure. According to Deleuze, this success was due mainly to Foucault's ability to maintain a decentralized model, that is to avoid hierarchies and representation within and outside the group. As he recalls in the seminars, and what was Foucault's idea for the formation of the GIP? Well, it's making a non-centralized group. Good. In this sense, it is a descendant of 68. How does 68 present itself? A non-centralized movement, a new type of struggle. This new type of struggle was called transversal, and Deleuze opposes transversality to centralization. He says, How was the GIP formed? What is a transversal struggle as opposed to centralized struggles? It is a struggle where there are no representatives. No one is represented. No one can say, I represent this. The group underwent several clashes with the police that became public matters. And seeing well-established intellectuals now taking to the street and confronting the police face to face was very new at the time, at least in France. But it was also at that time that a new discordance appeared between Foucault and Deleuze. It was not about the GIP, but rather about one of Foucault's disciples, Jacques Donzelot who had written a very Foucauldian thesis. Donzelot asked Deleuze to write a preface for it, which Deleuze agreed to do. But when he learned about it, Foucault did not rejoice, quite the opposite. Donzelot recalls Foucault saying the following, I detest that sort of thing. I can't stand it when old men come and put their stamp on young people's work. Foucault seemed to be annoyed at the perspective of losing a disciple or having to share one with Deleuze. Deleuze got wind of Foucault's hostility, and so instead of a preface, he wrote a postface which is now called The Rise of the Social, which you can find reproduced in chapter 10 of Two Regimes of Madness. At the same time, it's fair to mention that Foucault was also very worried about Deleuze's health, which was fragile and definitely not suited for clashes with the police. Following one event, we are told that Deleuze was left in a coma, even. This may have led Deleuze to a new appreciation of the theoretical aspect of the struggle. The social impact of the GIP was profound, reshaping the perceived role of intellectuals in society. Traditionally seen as advocates for and representatives of human rights, intellectuals now adopted a more confrontational and practical stance. You can have a look at text 32 of Desert Islands, which offers a glimpse into what the GIP was about if you're interested. The central idea that Foucault and Deleuze shared, as I mentioned before, was decentralization. No one should represent someone else. This meant that the intellectual must face the struggle like everybody else in the street. But this radical change did not go without some self-questioning on the part of Foucault. It is at that time, I believe, that Foucault became kind of self-conscious about the inextricable relation between power and the intellectual class. He began to realize, perhaps, that knowledge and power are so intimately linked with each other that even a new struggle would not suffice to break that link. In an interview, Foucault says this, Intellectuals realize that the masses can do without them and still be knowledgeable. The masses know perfectly well what's going on. It is perfectly clear to them. They even know better than the intellectuals do, and they say so convincingly enough. But a system of power exists to bar, to prohibit, invalidate their discourse and their knowledge. A power located not only in the upper echelons of censorship, but which deeply and subtly permeates the whole network of society. The intellectuals are themselves part of this system of power, as is the idea that intellectuals are the agents of consciousness and discourse. 
the role of the intellectual is no longer to situate himself slightly ahead or slightly to one side, so he may speak the silent truth of each and all. It is rather to struggle against those forms of power where he is both instrument and object, in the order of knowledge, truth, consciousness and discourse. The success of the Jip lay in transforming the intellectual's role, a change that was facilitated by the prominence of figures like Foucault and Deleuze and Sartre, which may go against the desire of decentralization in a way. But on a more personal level, it may have led Foucault to question the very validity and possibility of such struggles. This kind of self-examination, which I don't think was shared by Deleuze in any way, may have led to other disagreements of a more political nature, described by Duss in some details. But were these disagreements the cause of the effect of their separation? Duss seems to say that they were the cause of it, but I see it more as the symptom of something deeper, which is also alluded to by Duss, by the way. We will see how, in the late 70s, Foucault changed his perspective and found himself in a philosophical impasse. It seems that the source of his rancor towards Deleuze was that wherever Foucault was going with this self-questioning, Deleuze did not follow his lead. Thus argues that Foucault and Deleuze's friendship was ruined primarily by their political disagreements, much more than by their philosophical disagreements. But I would argue that it's the opposite. Foucault's change, in philosophical perspective, is what led to a split in other domains. We know that while Foucault admired difference in repetition and logic of sense, he remained perplexed by the anti -Oedipus. It is true that he wrote rather positive things about it, but a direct source tells us that he really disliked the book. The reason for this was most likely due to Deleuze and Guattari's treatment of desire. In the seminars, Deleuze says this, I remember Foucault telling me I will never stand the word desire. I said, why? He tells me with great, great kindness, whatever your meaning Deleuze and Guattari's attempts to explain that desire is absolutely not linked to lack, for me, I can't help but every time I say the word desire to see lack in it. Deleuze, on the other hand, disagrees with Foucault's notion of pleasure, as defined at the end of the first volume of the history of sexuality, called The Will to Knowledge. There, Foucault proposes to shift the focus of sexual studies from sex desire to bodies and pleasure. But this cannot work for Deleuze, because as Doss says quite correctly in my opinion, for Deleuze as for Spinoza or even Nietzsche, pleasure is the interruption of the process of desire. It is not its origin, and therefore it can only bring about a kind of infinite pursuit that can never be completed. Whatever the case may be, it appears that at the time of the will to knowledge, Foucault was operating a shift in theory, prompted perhaps by his previous bout of self-questioning, and it perplexed many on the intellectual scene. Indeed, Foucault's focus on pleasure seemed to trigger a return to the classical notion of truth as something that is given in advance. In a text published in Two Regimes of Madness, which is a letter written by Deleuze as a critique of the will to knowledge, and which was given to Foucault through one of their mutual friends. Deleuze writes this, If power arrangements are constituents of truth, if there is a truth in power, there must be a kind of power of truth as a counter-strategy against powers. Hence the problem of the intellectual for Michel and his way of reintroducing the category of truth, since, in renewing it completely by making it dependent on power, he finds a munition which can be turned against power. But I don't see how. We will have to wait for Michel to give his new conception of truth on the microanalytical level. Similarly with the problem of the body and its pleasures. Deleuze continues, Once again I am in a state of waiting. How do pleasures animate counter-powers? How does he conceive of this notion of pleasure? It was shortly after this letter, which seems overall to be very soft and polite as far as criticism goes, that Foucault decided to never see Deleuze again. And indeed he never would. But why? Why this criticism in particular? After all, Foucault was a public figure, very famous, and he was used to be criticized even by friends. Here, Duss explains that Foucault was terribly offended by Deleuze's critique because the will to knowledge was a point of inflection in Foucault's thought. In this book, Foucault came to a surprising reversal. He condemned anti-repressive fights, those very fights which he had championed for a decade. Duss says, Foucault's circle was disconcerted by the book's central argument questioning the battle against repression. It was hard to understand, after an entire decade of doing just this, how the battle on behalf of the freedom of sexual minorities could be viewed as a deployment of biopower. So Foucault was beginning to see the resistance to power as itself a product of power, which appears to be a colossal paradox. 
At first, sex for Foucault appeared as a way of liberation against sovereignty, because sovereignty could not control the spontaneity of sexual desire. But at the same time, the deployment of sexual discourses quickly became a new tool for a new form of power, Foucault argued. In The Will to Knowledge, Foucault writes this, The deployment of sexuality permits the techniques of power to invest life. By creating the imaginary element that is sex, the deployment of sexuality established one of its most essential internal operating principles, the desire for sex, the desire to have it, to have access to it, to discover it, to liberate it, to articulate it in discourse, and to formulate it in truth. It constituted sex itself as something desirable. And it is this desirability of sex that attaches each one of us to the injunction to know it, to reveal its law and its power. It is this desirability that makes us think we are affirming the rights of our sex against all power, when in fact we are fastened to the deployment of sexuality that has lifted up from deep within us a sort of mirage in which we think we see ourselves reflected, the dark shimmer of sex. Far from being the tool of our liberation, sex became, in Foucault's perspective, a jail cell of a new kind, in which a new, invisible and coercive power was throwing us. This led Foucault to formulate one of his most famous quotes. Where there is power, there is resistance. And yet, or rather consequently, this resistance is never in a position of exteriority in relation to power. In other words, Foucault saw resistance as just another form of power, meaning that emancipation through sexuality was not possible after all. It was the heart of the intellectual impasse he found himself in, and it was most incomprehensible for the people of the time. Just to give you an idea of the brutal treatment that Foucault received, the sociologist Jean Baudrillard wrote a book called Oublier Foucault, in reaction to the will to knowledge. In there, Baudrillard explains that, while he is not after Foucault personally, we should nonetheless move beyond the domination of certain figures that confine us to certain established frameworks of thought. I believe that Baudrillard's argument is fair enough, but what it shows first and foremost, I think, is that Foucault was in a position of weakness, intellectually and morally, in that he had reached a point of no return. Either everything is about power, or nothing is, and there is something more. But what is it? This impasse in which Foucault found himself could be why he needed Deleuze to be more supportive, and why he was so offended by his letter. When Baudrillard writes that, for him, Foucault, the political has no end, but only metamorphoses, from the despotic to the disciplinary, and at this level to the microcellular according to the same process belonging to the physical and biological senses, we can hear perhaps an echo of Deleuze's own mixed feelings vis-à-vis -vis the will to knowledge. In the seminars, Deleuze speaks exactly to this point. He says, So I believe that the crisis that Foucault was in, if I try to explain it without claiming to hold the slightest secret, it is a hypothesis that I'm making. I think that in fact there was a crisis and that he thought above all that there was not only a misunderstanding at the level of the will to knowledge, a misunderstanding between him and his reader, but that it was something much more serious, namely that he was in an impasse. And what was this impasse? That he had formed his knowledge power system as something very new, covering new grounds and huge diversity. Foucault is not one of these authors who repeat the same thing all the time. It was a diversity each time. Each time he gave everything back. But it was a stalemate. That was what? Good God, I don't have the means to get out of the point of view of power. Will I be a man of power? Ultimately, no matter what I do, am I still not on the side of power? Deleuze says, speaking for Foucault. Of course, Deleuze never intended to throw Foucault's works in the memory hole. Nor did he call Foucault a dinosaur, as Baudrillard did. His reaction to Foucault being in an intellectual impasse was rather to help him find a way out. How did Deleuze do this? To put things very schematically, Deleuze argued that while it is true that where there is power, there is resistance to power, this resistance comes in the form of points of resistance, which have to have a component that makes them at least in part exterior to power. Foucault had correctly identified, Deleuze says, the two components of knowledge and power, but what maintained Foucault in the impasse of power was that he didn't see that the interaction of knowledge and power implied something else, a third axis that somehow supports power and knowledge. Deleuze's attempt, which he finalizes in his book on Foucault, is to draw a third axis on top of knowledge and power, which he calls subjectivation. We will see what subjectivation is in a moment, but the question now would be this. In adding this third axis of subjectivation, did Deleuze make a child in Foucault's back? Did he betray his thought? Here, opinions tend to diverge. Some would say that, of course, Deleuze is reinterpreting Foucault, bringing him where he didn't go, which is technically true. But others would argue that Deleuze only pushed Foucault where he was already going, and where he would ultimately have gone had he not prematurely passed away. 
For example, Frédéric Gros, a specialist of Foucault, says this. Everything that he, Deleuze, says about the relationship between utterances and visibilities shows that he understood something very important, which I later heard in Foucault's last lectures at the Collège de France, that Deleuze could not have heard or read. It was the idea that he was constructing a direct ethics by making correspondences between visible acts and logoi, utterances. It is amazing to see how Deleuze, who couldn't have had any knowledge of the Collège de France lectures, was so accurate in his interpretation. I think it's fair to say that Deleuze brought Foucault where he was already going, in spite of the impasse. But the question now would be this. What is this subjectivation that Deleuze discerned in Foucault, this ethics that would help him out of the paradox of power? Foucault and Deleuze share a profound alignment in their interpretation of Nietzsche playing pivotal roles in revitalizing Nietzschean thought in continental philosophy. Their unity extended to a fervent commitment to resist tyranny, seeking to establish decentralized opposition against centralized power. Despite the successes of the GIP, it appeared that these successes were due more to the fame of Foucault, Deleuze or Sartre than to a real and repeatable model of transversality. It is highly questionable whether there can be such a model at all. The dissolution of the GIP in 1972 may have been a sign of this difficulty, and it may have left Foucault grappling with questions about the efficacy of political action, pondering whether the struggle against power might not paradoxically come from power itself and be instrumentalized by it, which would simply amount to replacing one tyranny with another, with the sexual discourse simply adding one tool to the toolkit of the society of control in which we live, rather than being a means for liberation. The solution that Deleuze offered was to say that beyond knowledge and power, there is subjectivation, a fundamental resistance that does not come from either power or knowledge. This is one of the main points in Deleuze's book on Foucault. In fact, in the seminars, Deleuze pinpoints a crucial moment where Foucault himself was beginning to discover points of resistance but had not yet found a way to cross the line towards subjectivation. Deleuze says this, How to cross the line, you understand? And in my opinion, this is the only explanation for the will to knowledge, and the following book in which he found it, meaning the means to cross the line towards subjectivation. What does all that mean? He found how to cross the line. I say in a certain way, we can mark in the will to knowledge this precise moment where he has not yet crossed it. It is the discovery of points of resistance. Because in fact, what can we say? Buku objects to himself, and it is much more than an objection. It is really something, it's a matter of state. He objects to himself, he says to himself, but you can't cross the line. You stay on the side of power. All you're capable of doing is accounting for forms of knowledge through power relations, and that's it. Then he discovers the points of resistance, but he does not yet have a status for them. He can't cross the line yet. He sees beyond the line. He sees beyond the line that there are points of resistance. But what to do with them? This notion of subjectivation, of points of resistance, is what Deleuze calls the outside, or the fold. It played a central role in Deleuze's later thought. The fold, according to Deleuze, brings the outside inward, constituting a depth of subjectivation that surpasses any individual subjectivity. Deleuze's subsequent exploration of Leibniz could be seen in this sense as an extension of his study of Foucault, delving into the complexities of subjectivity and the folds of the outside. As Deleuze says, the outside folds and from then on puts the unthought into thought, that is to say, constitutes an inside coextensive with the outside, an inside further, deeper than any interior world just as the outside was more distant than any outside world. But, by bending, the external line produces, produces what? What is this inside that is deeper than any inner world? Let's give it its name, which would also apply strangely to Heidegger, and call it subjectivity, which would therefore commit us to saying that the fold is subjectivation. The fold produces subjectivity. These points of resistance are the particular acts of subjectivation that determine relations of power, such that power in the form of institutions is an effect and not a cause of subjectivation, social or otherwise. In arguing this, Deleuze crosses for Foucault the line towards this process of permanent change in which power is not central anymore. Subjectivation, due to its nature, is homogeneous to both power and knowledge. And perhaps Deleuze already saw this long before Foucault's passing, but couldn't say it. That's perhaps what he was waiting for, but never saw, due to Foucault's untimely death. So of the two most significant spiritual sons of Nietzsche, the father of modern thought, one came to doubt, stumbling, it seems, on self-reflection, while the other maintained the fundamental work of creation that makes thought what it is. <laughs>
But in a certain sense, Foucault's doubt is what brought Deleuze's thought to its full amplitude. And you can say that if the 20th century becomes Deleuzean, it is undoubtedly because it was Foucauldian at some point. As I mentioned in the beginning, this story is not primarily the story of a disagreement. I think it's the story of how two brothers were reunited beyond the grave, beyond petty intellectual feuds and ephemeral political opinions. When Foucault's biographer, James Miller, asked Deleuze in 1990 what destroyed their friendship, Deleuze answered evasively in three points, essentially saying that they evaluated things differently, that they simply saw each other less often, and the bottom line was that he, Deleuze, missed Foucault very much. He regretted not visiting him more often, in spite of Foucault's desire for distance. On his part, it appears that Foucault's last desire was to reconcile with Deleuze. On his deathbed, Foucault was rereading Spinoza's ethics, perhaps as an indirect way to do this. They did not meet again, but there is no question that their mutual affection won, in the end, over any and all disagreements. So I guess you can say that it's a happy ending. It's also fair to say that, in many ways, Deleuze prolonged Foucault's thought and led it where it would have or may have gone, had Foucault not disappeared. But Foucault's doubt was instrumental in allowing Deleuze's thought to evolve. Deleuze's book on Foucault certainly shows this, as well as other texts, such as Postscriptum on Societies of Control, published in 1990. Their feud did not destroy their eternal love and friendship, but it revealed their respective temperaments. As Deleuze says, very respectfully, of his friend, Foucault is a man who, for example, in the demonstrations of the time, had a kind of violence, contained violence. It was as if he was trembling within himself, but not with fear. He was trembling with violence. In their duo, Foucault was the passionate and fiery one, while Deleuze was more pondered. Their great success and creativity may have come in part from the encounter between these two antagonistic forces that they incarnated, and while it may look like a tale of jealousy, I think it was ultimately the story of an encounter between great cosmic forces that exist way beyond good and evil. I'd like to thank my incredible patrons for their fantastic support, and for now I'd like to thank you all for watching, and see you soon.